morning, everyone. Welcome to a new Tetra seminar. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce to you today Chloe Agar. She recently completed her DPhil in history at the University of Oxford, and she was the Deutsch Scholar in African History at St. Cross College from 2018 to 2021. She researches hagiography, preserving Coptic, and teaches Egyptology students in the Griffith Institute. And she's also a research assistant at the Faculty of Theology and Religion and Harris Manchester College at Oxford. Previously, she completed an MA in archaeology with German at the University of Liverpool in 2018, and a BA in Egyptology with Coptic at the University of Oxford in 2017. And today she's going to talk to us about her uh, DPhil dissertation. Chloe, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you um, for that nice introduction, Andy, uh, and for the invitation in the first place. Uh, now we get to do the fun part. Can someone uh, enable screen sharing? Whichever one of you is the host. Okay, Dan's giving me a thumbs up. Good sign. Hey, okay. Okay, so you should be able to see a PowerPoint. Excellent. Uh, awesome. Okie dokie. Um, so yeah, thanks for having me. Um, and this is going to be a section of the second chapter of my thesis, uh, which is about archaeology and cult practice. Um, so, as might be expected, there are many cult practices associated with the cult of saints. These are ways that the saints were venerated and in which ecclesial, ecclesiastical figures and lay congregants participated in the cult of saints. Um, so, how the practices themselves have received attention in scholarship um, they have, but this is something that has been somewhat overlooked in some areas, particularly how the attestation of practices in the archaeological and textual evidence varies. This is because the emphasis has been on the archaeological and documentary text evidence for practices which, while useful, leaves how, how the cult of saints is referred to in hagiography. This is a significant omission because the way that writers addressed cult practices in hagiography gives us an insight into their decision making and priorities. The creation, copying, and recitation of hagiography was in itself a cult practice. Um, such texts include examples of other cult practices within them, which would presumably uh, have been familiar to the priestly and lay audiences. But as hagiography was recited in the devotional space of churches and saint shrines and was written by ecclesiastical figures, the writers chose which practices to include and which to omit. So in this paper, I'll analyze the evidence for some of the examples of cult practices in Egypt and how they are portrayed in Coptic hagiography to determine why writers made the choices that they did. Through comparing hagiographical documentary and archaeological evidence, I will show that the impression of cult practices given in Coptic hagiography um, isn't a full reflection of the reality and that pagan practices were still alive and well in ostensibly Christian spaces in Egypt, and thus that we need to consider multiple forms of evidence to develop a full picture of how the cult functioned. So the first cult practice that I will analyze in this paper is incubation, whereby people sleep in a saint shrine in the hope of receiving aid that they've requested. It's perhaps one of the most well-known practices associated with the cult of saints. Um, it's attested in Coptic hagiography um, all over, uh, particularly in healing miracles, such as those performed by the healing Saint Caluthus, uh, but also those performed by other uh, military saints like Menas. When supplicants go to Saint shrines to incubate, the saint appears to them and either instructs them on how to resolve their problems or performs a miracle there and then. Such problems include injuries, infertility, uh, and demonic possession. They also include issues of social status, such as a deacon who is demoted because of a 
slanderous accusations against him. Um, however, when Caluthus restores this deacon to his rightful position, this still involves healing because he effectively channels his ability to heal through the deacon into a, an ill woman who is also incubating at the shrine. So the inclusion of incubation in hagiography, therefore, seems to have been a way in which the writers instructed their audiences in how to participate in the cult of saints. Incubation as a cult practice is further evidenced in the archaeological record, although with some debate, of the shrines named in the Coptic hagiography that I examine in my thesis, uh, principally for the archaeological um, sections I discuss the distribution of where shrines are, um, but only three shrines of all those that you know might get named in the hagiography that I looked at, only three have actually been like identified and excavated. Um, and these are Abu Mina, which is dedicated to Menace, a church dedicated to Caluthus at Antinopolis, and the monastery of Foibamon at Dera Bahri. Uh, all three shrines have been published extensively. Uh, while there's some uncertainty over where incubation may have been practiced at each site, um, I think it's fair to assume it might have happened somewhere at each site. Uh, Peter Grossman especially has identified parts of Abu Mina and the church at Antonopolis, which he believes were used for incubation. Uh, with the most compelling of these suggestions being four rooms south of the church at Antonopolis, which seem to have been able to be locked from the inside and are separated from the space in which liturgical practices would have been performed, enabling liturgy and incubation to occur without either being disturbed, which presumably would have been practical for a church. So as both hagiography and the archaeological records show evidence of incubation being practiced in the cult of saints in Egypt, the question arises of why writers included it. This is because incubation is not a uniquely Christian practice, but was actually practiced throughout the ancient Mediterranean world. Perhaps St. Shrines incorporated incubation because that was a key practice in pagan healing shrines. And so to encourage the lay audience to go to saint shrines for the same support, writers also incorporated that practice and Christianized it. The particular way that the lay audience was told they could access the saints would also position Christian sacred spaces, like churches and monasteries, and the priests who ministered within them as intermediaries between lay congregants and the divine. So that's our first example. The second one is oracles. Um, and this one is not attested in Coptic hagiography, but is uh, quite extensively in the archaeological record. Um, at the shrine of Caluthus at Antonopolis, as well as the saint being approached for healing, he was also approached as an oracle. This isn't the only oracle cult known to have existed in Egypt uh, during the Byzantine and early Islamic period. Um, as there's evidence of six others, but it's the only one um, in my thesis. None of the miracles in Caluthus' hagiography concern an oracle. If a supplicant asks for aid from the saint, the saint appears and provides explicit instructions. For instance, when telling a woman whose breasts have been possessed by a demon how she should go about performing an exorcism. Meanwhile, documentary evidence of an oracle at the shrine has been found in the form of over 200 oracle tickets written about a number of times by Ellen de Latre. Uh, and here are a couple of images from one of his publications. Um, oracle tickets follow the format of a written question about a life decision to be made or an illness being experienced and two separate answers, one affirmative and one negative which would then be taken to the church where one would be chosen, with the precise means of that choosing not being well understood. Uh, and the chosen answer would then be returned to the asker as the course of action that they should take, and the other being discarded at the site and then found uh, by archaeologists. As might be expected for a healing site, many of these tickets at Caluthus Shrine ask for help with health issues which shows the importance of his healing role, which begs the question of why writers included 
incubation, but not the oracle. The omission may have been done to focus on the saint's active role in resolving supplicants' problems, in which case the appearance of the saint during miracles would replace the use of an oracle by having him verbally respond to supplicants. Alternatively, because the oracular practice identified at Caliph's shrine is also attested in Pharaonic and Greco-Roman Egypt, it could be that writers chose to not mention a pagan practice. Incubation was perhaps a useful practice for them to acknowledge in hagiography, because that would encourage the audience to go to shrines and venerate the saints. Whereas while acknowledging an oracle would achieve the same basic aim, it would also give supplicants more agency in their interaction with the saint and with a priestly intermediary. Based on the oracle tickets found at the church, tickets were always responded to. It seems and a response taking a long time wouldn't necessarily have been practical for the priest or whoever was administering this practice. Incubation, meanwhile, if it was in this slightly separate location at the site away from liturgy, could theoretically take more time and not be disruptive. Writers sometimes have supplicants helped uh, when they're incubating on the same day or the same night that they come to the shrine. Uh, such as the woman with the possessed breasts and also a childless couple who come to Caliphus for help. Um, but others wait for significantly longer, uh, such as a man who wants his lameness healed, actually waiting for months and only being healed when he stops being impatient and demanding of the saint. As oracles are therefore not included in hagiography by writers, it could be asked why they included saints appearing in visions to supplicants in Coptic hagiography, given that a neuromancy, divination using dreams, was also practiced in Pharaonic and Greco-Roman Egypt. This further indicates that practices with pagan origins or associations could be incorporated into hagiography as ostensibly Christian traditions by writers, provided that they could be suitably accommodated within Christian frameworks. As far as saints appearing in visions are concerned, dreams and visions appear to prophets in biblical texts, and thus there would have been some justification within the context of Abrahamic religions for writers to include them in hagiography. But a higher power appearing uh, is limited. So where prophets in the Bible and saints in hagiography might see angels, they might see Christ, they might hear the voice of God, Lay people in hagiography can only see saints, the sort of holiest of human beings, and they can invoke such visions through prayer, but ultimately it's the, the decision of the saint uh, as and when they appear. It can therefore be seen uh, so far that writers chose which cult practices to include and which to exclude from hagiography, and that the practices happening at saint shrines could be more varied than hagiography alone suggests, and that pagan practices were adapted into the Christian cult of saints. So the third practice I'm going to look at is like the oracle at the shrine of Caliphus, only attested for one of the saints in my thesis. It's attested at the monastery of Foymon at Deir al-Bahri. This site was removed without excavation uh, in order to get to the Pharaonic temple of Hatshepsut underneath it, hence the photograph. Um, but there's been much reconstruction of how the monastery may have been structured and how it may have operated, uh, done using archival records, both from the site itself and from the original excavation at Deir al-Bahri. Like other saints' hagiography, uh, in Feudemont's hagiography, healing takes place through incubation at his shrine. Um, However, in one room of this monastery were found stone vessels carved from the pharaonic columns and coated on the interior with waterproof mortar. There are two theories for the purpose of these vessels. The first is that they were used for cooking, and the second is that they were used for ritual ablutions. It seems more likely that they were used for ritual ablutions because that practice is referred to in the documentary evidence from the site, specifically in one child donation document and one self donation document. The role of the donated individual who worked at the site rather than becoming a monk included filling vessels for this purpose. However, because only four documents in total refer to the basins, it's unclear how common the practice of ritual ablutions actually was. 
Um, they could have been performed by supplicants visiting or by monks um, to purify themselves for entering the shrine dedicated to the saint at the monastery. But in the donation documents, the implication is that the washing alone is actually sufficient to heal without incubation happening. But then the fact that only two donation documents, which by their nature are, if I may say it, quite fictitious and quite formulaic, um, include this healing through washing, while the other many, many, many documents found include healing directly by the saint, this suggests that the general view being conveyed was that the saint was directly interceding. There's no mention of ritual ablutions in the Hagiography of Floyd Mum, so it seems to have been a practice that might have facilitated healing um, at the site, but which writers chose not to include. Um, this may simply be because because none of the saints' hagiography, um, which is limited anyway, actually mentions the site at Deir el -Bahri. It instead mentions three shrines at other locations around Egypt. It may therefore be that because that particular shrine wasn't mentioned, the practices that happened there weren't either. Um, practices that might have been present because a monastery specifically was uh, where the shrine was. Alternatively, if the ritual ablutions were something familiar to the audience, the writers may have focused on the saint as the agent of healing, rather than on accurately representing cult practices similar to the oracle, as otherwise miraculous powers may have been attributed to the water rather than to the saint. So the three examples which I have so far examined suggest that writers were deliberately including and excluding certain practices that were part of the cult of saints, of which priestly and lay audiences would have been aware in order to focus on Christian or Christianized elements, as well as positioning the saints as the agents who would assist the audience should they need it. This would have also positioned priests and monks as necessary intermediaries between lay people and the saints through being custodians of the sacred space, rather than lay people being able to interact with saints in a more direct fashion and therefore being able to access the divine themselves. Um, so as we've so far seen, any practice which had pagan associations was only included in hagiography by writers provided that its inclusion in a Christian context could be justified. It might therefore be expected that the fourth and final practice that I will analyze, magic, you know, the use of spells and amulets to produce a desired outcome, would not be included in hagiography. This practice is well attested in Egypt from the Pharaonic period all the way down to the Byzantine and early Islamic periods in the form of texts and inscribed objects. And so it's clearly a pagan practice which was still being used by lay people outside of Christian devotional spaces. But magic is in fact included in hagiography where it is denounced as something not to be practiced showing that the pagan could be positioned as bad and the Christian as good in these texts where there was perhaps perceived as being no danger of the two intersecting. In a fragmentary miracle of Caliphus, a young widow comes to the shrine to be effectively cured of a curse which has been placed upon her. Her soldier husband cast a spell upon her so that in the event of his death, she wouldn't remarry. The worst comes to pass and this soldier husband dies and the spell activates. Uh, but it works in such a way that his widow becomes frail and unattractive, thus deterring prospective suitors. Meanwhile, in a miracle of Caliphus, uh, not Caliphus, Mercurius, a young man falls hopelessly in love with an archon's daughter and enlists the magician's help to persuade her father to let him marry her. The magician's solution to this young man's predicament is to curse the archon's daughter making her deathly ill so that she will only be cured when the Archon permits the marriage. Uh, the Archon instead takes his daughter to Mercuria's shrine, where the saint cures her, so she is fine. Uh, the saint chastises the young man for his poor decision-making in going to a magician, and then he kidnaps and beats up the magician to punish him. Yet, in the miracles of Claudius, um, which I didn't include in my thesis, um, but provides an interesting example here. In the fourth miracle, in which the saint foils a sort of convoluted plot by a magician, 
the saint uses magic as it would have been recognizable sort of as magic to lay audiences. After he has foiled the magician's theft of an elderly blind woman's money from the shrine, Claudius helps the magician in his mission to enable a barren woman to bear children. The saint instructs the magician to write his name upon a bowl and fill it with water, and that when the woman drinks this water, she will then give birth. While this is basically how magic was practiced, the saint also explicitly instructs the magician not to write anything else on the bowl, um, including sort of spells that were presumably from the magician's own repertoire. Claudius is not the only saint in Coptic hagiography who provides instructions for how one might go about healing. Um, as again, we come back to the example of Caliphus instructing the woman whose breasts have been possessed by a demon um, to do something specific. In this case, to go to the place of the silver cross. Um, and he also tells the aforementioned childless couple who also comes to his shrine uh, to drink water, specifically from his shrine in order to conceive. As such, it seems that the writer included this sort of magical component in Claudius instructing the magician in how to cure infertility to highlight how the saint's method would be successful while the magician's wouldn't be. This indicates that Claudius' cure, although it resembled a magical spell, functioned through divine grace rather than through a mortal magician's willpower. This distinguishes practices that are not included by writers in hagiography, like the Oracle of Cluthus, um, as humanity willing a desired effect rather than accepting that the effect happening was actually at the behest of the divine, of a higher power. So while magic and miracles both cause supernatural phenomena to happen, for one the human is the agent and for the other the divine is, showing how they are differentiated within Christianity and thus how certain practices could be included in formal Christian texts and others not. So, in conclusion, I've addressed the omission of what hagiography tells us about cult practice and the cult of saints in Egypt. While the impression of cult practices given in Coptic hagiography is not a full reflection of the reality, and pagan practices were still alive and well in ostensibly Christian spaces in Egypt, hagiography provides an insight into writers' decision-making and priorities. It was the Christian devotional context in which they were writing and in which their audiences would have received the hagiography, which determined whether they presented practices which are known to have been performed from the documentary and archaeological record. It's likely that writers knew that their audiences were aware of and participated in practices, regardless of whether they were included in hagiography. But the writer's objective was to guide their audiences to what they considered appropriate Christian participation in the cult. Writers emphasised the benefits of Christianity and a Christian shrine to the audience, and perhaps also made hagiography more orthopraxe and a presentation of an ideal Christian environment, rather than a reflection of the reality. Uh, so thank you very much for your attention, um, and thank you again for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you very much for this fascinating presentation. Um, we open now the floor for discussion. So if you have questions, you can either raise your electronic hand or type it in the chat or wave over at us. I see we already have the first one. Please. Yes, sure. I'll go ahead. Um, perhaps a short remark. Uh, shouldn't it be loose there and not loo there? of the washing, you forgot perhaps an S mm -hmm. or not. Um, could you say that? One more? Is, huh? To include an S in that word. Yeah. I'm not sure what you mean, but I'm sure I'm just being daft. The loose there, the baptism, the washing, <laughs> the washing. Yeah, thank you. For yeah. That. So, okay. I think perhaps it is good. <laughs> yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, I mean, in terms of... Um, I'm not sure. <laughs> Yeah, no, I'm I'm not sure either, but yeah, I 
I would like to develop, as I say, this, this little uh, chunk of uh, one chapter of my thesis uh, into sort of a, a full, you know, published article. So looking at baptism, um, you know, given these basins of, say, sitting in a monastery would be a good idea um, to see whether they would have performed that function and how um, that then relates to what I've said and whether that sort of changes anything that I think about that or whether that sort of fits in. I would like to look at that. So that's a good, that's a good thought. Thank you. Uh, Margaret, please. Hi, um, thank you. That was absolutely fascinating. Thank um, you. I just, yes, no, it really was. I look forward to the dissertation and any articles and so on. Um, uh, the question about magic, uh, mm -hmm. and I wasn't sure how much you were committing yourself to um, what you actually said, which was the willpower of the magician. And I'm wondering whether uh, sort of, if there was a well-defined definition of how magic worked that would include specifically his willpower as opposed to um, some kind of uh, actions such as writing on the ball and whether the more uh, intellectual of uh, the people in the area would have shared um, St. Augustine's uh, teaching that magic is by definition uh, done by demons. Mm. So the difference between a miracle and and yeah. uh, and a uh, something performed done by a magician, they can both do the exact same thing. The results will be yeah. the same. One comes from God, and the other is done by demons. Yeah. Um, but I was just wondering. Uh, how yeah. Um. Again, yeah, I can't speak for further west, but within Egypt, in a sort of, if you like, a Christian yeah. context, um, so the, the general consensus is magic is kind of denounced because, as you say, it's it's bad. It's demons. It's not God. You know, why why would you? Uh, um, why would you do that? But within everyday, if you like, life um, in Egypt, time when you know Christianity abounds, people are still doing exactly what you just described. They're doing the magic actions. They're they're writing on the stuff. That they're writing spells. They're invoking. Um, entities to come and, and do something for them be it heal something or curse someone they don't like or force someone to fall in love with them all the sort of classics um and I can see how in an ecclesiastical context you would not appreciate that but in the sort of lay context mm -hmm. um demons and Christ and the older Egyptian um, gods are all kind of invoked together. Mm -hmm. um, so you get spells, I think it's one of the Schmidt ones, Schmidt one or two, um, where Isis and Horus are getting invoked for a love spell so the idea is to make the uh, object of someone's desire, like, love them back. But in exactly the same spell where you've got this sort of narrative of Isis and Horus, you also have Christ being invoked, kind of in the same breath. So for lay magic, any sort of powerful figure was all kind of getting amalgamated in, um, to use in that context. Um, 
So while the church might have thought, yeah, magic is demons. This is bad. We don't like this. For lay people, it was a, a much more nuanced um, perspective and anything could be helpful um, and help you to achieve whatever aim you, you had, but also anything could be invoked negatively against someone else. So you could be struck down by Christ or demons or whatever it might be in the same way as the church would view that as being sort of solely a, a demon thing. Um, in as far as how magic was defined, yeah, in a fuller version, I would probably add how or how are they um, contemporaneously defining this? Is it willpower, as I've said? Um, is it specific actions? And as you say, the distinction is at least seems to purely be, is it something that is happening through through the divine, in which case it's totally fine, or is it something happening purely through the actions of a a mortal magician deciding they want to bring something about? Um, and I know that there are kind of like manuals, uh, if you will, from earlier in Egyptian history. I'm not sure if the same thing exists once we get into um late antiquity but i will look into that yeah thank you very much yeah thank you indeed i see robert simpson has another question yes it thank you it wasn't really another question i was wanting to comment on um the pagan practices of magic and why they or how they were viewed by um, at least what you might call strict Christians or Christian authorities or whatever. Um, there's a very fine distinction in from the Christian point of view, of course, between demons and the former pagan gods who had previously been worshipped or, or in the earlier Coptic period still were being worshipped. Um, they would be, I uh, suppose, as it were, demoted to being demons mm. once they, their, uh, their main cults were no longer practiced or allowed. Um, but they would um, perhaps remain in the form of beings invoked by magicians. Um, so you, you could say that these magicians were, in fact, um, by invoking the power of other beings apart from Christ and, and the Christian God, uh, continuing in some form or other paganism. And that's why they, one, well, one reason at least, why they would be viewed in, in a hostile light by, by the Christian authorities. Uh, you, I, I'm not an expert on this, but we do have spells preserved from the period in which all kinds of beings are invoked. And I think as, as Chloe says, it's rather a mishmash between um, old pagan deities and um, ones from the Judeo-Christian tradition, uh, either sort of orthodox ones like Sabaoth or sort of invented ones in the same style like Yaldabaoth, um, which have kind of Gnostic connotations. So I think that the distinction is not so much between, or I'm, at least my impression is that the distinction is not so much between a magician um, acting without any reference to the supernatural world, but rather acting with reference to the kind of wrong kind of <laughs> supernatural mm. world. And this has been a stock, um, um, what's the word, accusation uh, by Christians against the practice of magic um, for the whole um, period of Christianity, in fact, that um, witches or magicians or whatever they might be get their power from the devil or demons, uh, as, as Margaret said, Augustine condemns it on that um, basis, and, and it was a stock um, element of the 
um, accusations against witches in the 16th century, for example, and 17th century. Yeah, no, I quite agree, um, Robert, like, <clears throat> and, so, um, and in developing this out, I would look at examples of spells and quite sort of this mishmash um, of different supernatural beings and say, so see, and say, so to what extent, exactly where is this line being drawn? Is it you're invoking the, the wrong kind of supernatural being? Is there something else within the practice that in a Christian context is not appreciated? But yeah, I think the main thing is probably that source of where the, the power is coming from. Is it God or is it anything other than God? As you say, the Egyptian deities do kind of get demoted down to this kind of demonic role within Christianity, but they're still sort of alive and well, as it were, and getting invoked outside of Christian contexts. And some cults, um, thinking like Isis, for example, last for quite a long time before they're eventually sort of completely superseded by... Um, Christian churches and shrines, etc. Thank you. Yep, thank you very much. Emanuela? Yes, uh, thank you. That was really very, very interesting and uh, uh, really very rich in information. And also my question is also a question of uh, um, really comprehension, actually. Perhaps you have uh, explained this and uh, I missed it, but I was wondering about the ritual ablutions. Um, mm. Really, now about um, if the information that we have is only in a geographical text, and if they're in description of how this was really performed as a ritual, if it was an ablution. And I think that you also mentioned healing in relation with that. And I was wondering if we know anything about blessed waters used in this context or it was just mm. any kind of connection or what you call it of waters so thank you mm -hmm. so i don't know a huge amount about ritual illusions and i'm not sure if that's just because there isn't a lot written about it or i just haven't read what i was written about it uh in full um as I say, this is a theory posited um, in a couple of articles, one by Arata Papa Constantinou and one by Geza Schenka, um, on the purpose of these basically basins that are in this room within the, the monastery of Feubermann. Part of the problem is no one really knows what that room was for, or what many of the rooms are for because the monastery was effectively disassembled to get to the Phronic temple that it stands on or stood on. Um, because um, the Egyptians um, throughout their history uh, had a habit of reusing previously occupied spaces. It's no different once we get into Christianity. Um, so you have in the desert all of these nice big convenient monumental structures so they just they move in um and so because the site was not properly excavated it was basically destroyed to get to the temple it's all theoretical what the different rooms that have been identified might have been for um so Naville's theory um originally was that the same room was a kitchen and that the basins were cooking pots, which is also a perfectly sensible theory. Um, and it's purely thought that the later on by Papa Constantinou and Schenker that this space was actually more of a, a cult space rather than a kitchen space because they've identified the next door room as where incubation may have happened, where the like actual shrine of Feuermann might have been. Um, 
so they think the basins were more sort of about uh, purification or ritual uh, acts rather than cooking pots. As for how it would have been performed, I don't know whether there would have been like holy water, as you've said, or whether it would have just been water um, that was sort of holy by association almost. Um, if Papa Constantinou and Schenker are right about this adjacent room being the shrine space uh, or an incubation space and the room with the basins therefore having this ritual function, I would guess that uh, monks or supplicants would have washed using the water in the basins before then entering that more sacred space to kind of purify themselves um, at a sort of practical guess. Um, there's no real instruction I'm aware of if that is what the basins were used for, how that was done, partly because, again, some more good evidence that they were used for that rather, rather than perhaps for cooking is these references in the donation documents. Um, the problem with donation documents is they're about as reliable as hagiography a lot of the time. Because they record uh, someone, usually um, a child, usually a son of a, of a couple, being donated to the monastery as a, a servant or, or a worker. Um, but the narrative within that is entirely unreliable because it's all very much the same. So usually the parents uh, request a child because they're having trouble conceiving. Uh, the saint obliges, they have this child, they're so grateful that they say, you know, when this child's a bit older, we'll donate him to the shrine because we're so grateful. It's kind of that Abraham and Isaac narrative almost. And then the child gets a bit older and they're really fond of the child, so they refuse to donate. And they're like, no, we'll just keep the child. And then the saint is annoyed because they've broken their promise. And so he strikes the child down and makes the child really ill. And so the parents have to bring the child to the mind to get him healed. And then they're so grateful they leave the child there anyway. And in a couple of donation documents, the way the healing happens is this child is, is washed with water from basins at the shrine and then sort of gets better. So that would suggest that was a, a practice that was happening at the shrine. Um, and it was the donated individuals, so sort of the servants, if you like, job to fill these basins. So that suggests they were used for a ritual purpose, but equally, if you've got servants filling basins with water, that could also be for cooking. So it's very, that one in particular of the four examples in my presentation is the most sort of speculative because it's the one we simply have the least evidence to help us with, um, which is why it's been debated um, a bit, but not really talked about as much as other things like incubation and oracles for which we have quite a bit more evidence floating about. I, I hope that is helpful. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you indeed. We have now Lucy Parker, then Dan, and then a question in the chat, but uh, please the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Chloe, for a really interesting paper. Um, you were just talking in one of the answers to the questions about, um, I think, um, correct me if I'm wrong, a kind of difference between a kind of clerical and lay attitude towards magic and what you might call pagan practices. Um, I mean, I'm thinking elsewhere in the Eastern Mediterranean world, you see clergy engaging, some clergy, not all clergy, engaging in what we might see as sort of pagan practices, perhaps most strikingly, Nicholas of Zion sacrificing oxen as a kind of thanksgiving to God. Um, I just wondered if in Egypt you have evidence of clergy of some types engaging in these kinds of practices too. So uh, off the top of my head, generally anything you might construe as pagan practice like sacrificing oxen uh not viewed very well by clergy um 
some clergy more vehemently opposed to, or at least in their writings, more vehemently opposed to pagan practices than others. Um, I'm sure Robert will be very happy that I'm now going to mention Shinute. Um, uh, the abbot of the White Monastery, who in his writings absolutely denounces anything he perceives as pagan and is like full on iconoclastic, violent, sort of militant approach to these things, uh, shall we say. Um, and then I can't think, and um, the church fathers I am less expert on than say martyr saints but i can't think of any examples of clergy engaging with those sorts of practices it's more that they're either denouncing such practices outright or they're kind of not mentioning them and so I think it's more that idea of they must have been aware stuff that they considered pagan was going on. They'd be really unobservant if they weren't. Um, as we've talked about magical spells, like obviously their congregations were still participating in non-Christian stuff. Um, but it's more that in the, the sacred Christian space, they're trying to kind of um, advertise behaving in a Christian way. So they're concentrating on, you should do this, you should do that, rather than bringing up any of the pagan stuff um, that they must have been aware was going on. It's sort of, a, this is how we'd like you to behave. Um, and yeah, from the chat, Shinute ac accuses people of doing many, many unsavory things um, and goes around smashing up idols, if I remember. He has a, there's a pagan neighbor somewhere that he takes offense to as well. Um, so yeah, I don't think in the Egyptian context you got necessarily clergy participating in pagan activity. I think it's more a denouncement or just a um, convenient ignoring. Um, but if I come across any examples of priests doing as you describe in other contexts, I would find that very interesting. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Dan. Uh, thank you very much, Chloe. <clears throat> very, very interesting material. What caught my eye and I'm curious about is, uh, of course, the notion that um, uh, geographical texts that we have do not fully reflect the practices um, of uh, the, the cultic practices around, uh, the, like you showed at the beginning. Um, to some point, that's expected, but I'm 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 curious how how you see this. Is it all polemical, like we're frowned upon or entirely um, rejected by uh, priests so, and therefore by authors, or is uh, more of, um, you know, people when they do things, they do things, people when they write hydrographical texts, they do other things, like in the same way in which this conversation differs from the conversation I'll have a bit later on with my mom. It's not a matter that I, some things are um, forbidden or frowned upon from one to another, it's just different genres. Whenever people go and do things, do things, and whenever they write, they write in a genre. I don't know, how do you see that on, if you slide, if you have a slide uh, from one uh, pole to another, where would you see this? I think there's definitely, um... I would say there's probably both aspects to it because you wouldn't kind of expect, at least from my understanding of it, hagiography to like lords, non-Christian practices. That would strike me as counterintuitive. So I think you're right in the regard that there's certain stuff that you either would or wouldn't mention in a hagiographical context. And 
that's kind of what I find interesting here. There's some stuff that you kind of would anticipate them not to mention because, yeah, that's a bit pagan. OK, that makes sense. And then other things that they obviously have adapted in. But for this sort of Christian purpose of this is how we want you to engage with the cults or we're using this as an example of what not to do. Please don't do it. Um, Equally, I think there was probably also a practical element, because as we've sort of already said, pagan practices were alive and well um, for a long time post Christianity arriving in, in Egypt and sort of really getting going. So you also have this sort of tension between ecclesiastical figures and pagan stuff that's going on. Um, so if you have clerical figures who are actively destroying pagan sites, it stands that you also might get such sites denounced in hagiography or kind of like erased within that context of we're not going to talk about that because that's not proper. Um, thinking like, for example, when the Serapium gets destroyed. Um, and that's one of the sort of pagan sites that survives for slightly longer anyway, once Christianity's around. Um, and then you also have um, shrines to Isis or temples of Isis, which actually survive pretty much longer than any other pagan site in Egypt. Um, partly because one of them is quite far south, um, away from sort of Alexandria and all of this ecclesiastical influence that's coming up from the patriarchate. Um, but also there's this idea that some pagan sites are deliberately replaced with Christian ones. Uh, some suggested sites for that, there's like no evidence. There's a pagan site there before anyway, so either they did a really good job of erasing it or that didn't happen. Um, but while there isn't very much of it left, um, it's thought the, the shrine of Cyrus and John um, near to Abu Mina um, was sort of partly built deliberately as a replacement to a shrine of Isis. Um, so, you know, the Shrine of Isis is sort of trashed and then they park the Shrine of Cyrus and John on top of it. So I think it's both purposes. I think there's a polemical aspect of there's certain things that are sensible to do or not do within hagiography for that. But there's also this expectation of some things, as you say, just simply don't make sense in that context. So why would you why would you do that? Like you say, talking to your mum and this is probably quite different. It will be. <laughs> Indeed. Thank you very much. We have a question in the chat from uh, Katrina Papadopoulos. She thanks you for your presentation and she says regarding incubation, we had the three incubation sites you investigate known for pagan incubation, hence providing additional motive to Christianize. And conversely, where the pagan incubation sites associated with Christian saints or hagiography, where there was no mention of the practice and no effort to Christianize or them incubation? Uh, so yeah, this kind of builds slightly on uh, what I was just saying in response to Dan. Um, so the three sites um, in my thesis, so the three sites that we actually sort of have of Caluthus, Menas, and Boibamon, um, None of those, I'm not saying it wasn't possible, but none of those were uh, known for pagan incubation and then sort of reoccupied by Christians and taken over. Um, the church at Antonopolis, I mean, there's been a bit of discussion about it being built on top of something else. But there's sort of no sign of a sort of pagan deity shrine that they built on top of. I think it was they more built on top of something else less sort of exciting that was already there. So that's sort of exclusively Christian. Abimina, it's been suggested that that's built on top of a pagan shrine in the same way 
as Abu Kir, where Cyrus and John's shrine is. But unlike Abu Kir, there is like, as far as I can see, no evidence that was ever anything pagan there before Abu Mina was constructed. So again, that's purely Christian. And then the shrine at Der al-Bakri, while the monastery is built on and in a pharaonic temple, that pharaonic temple would not have been used for such a purpose. That's not the function of that kind of temple. That's a funerary temple of a pharaoh. Um, so that's there to sort of commemorate and memorialize them uh, post-death, kind of in tandem with them being buried sort of in the Valley of the Kings. But sort of general supplicants who would have incubated to get help with stuff would not have been able to enter that space. Um, that's more of a, a priestly space or somewhere where very particular individuals would be entitled to go. So it only would have sort of opened up for more general access, if you like, once it was a monastery. Um, because the monks would have perhaps accepted visitors who might want to incubate. Um, and then pagan uh, incubation sites associated with um, saints. Off the top of my head, I don't know. I say pay, there, there were pagan sites that survived for a sort of respectably long time. In Christian Egypt. I don't know if incubation was practiced at any of them. I would have to look. I'm thinking particularly shrines of Isis. Um, but I don't know if she got, you know, incubation visitors specifically. So that is something I'll have to look at. But off the top of my head, I can't think of anything. Um, if that answers that. Yeah. I think it really does. Thank you very much. There is a small question from Margaret that I don't know if she wants to ask it herself, but it's about how much of the geography and the donation that you were talking about in response to a previous question has been translated into English. But Margaret, do you want to comment or say anything? Um, hi, no, no, no special comments. I just, I just wondered uh, if the speaker could send me an email. And we could get into conversation about that. So I put my email down there. Um, again, it was a, a fascinating talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, yeah, and just purely an answer. And I will uh, send you an email as well. Yes. Uh, much of the hagiography I refer to is translated into English. Some is translated into French and German. But uh, most of Caluthus is in <laughs> Um, but there is a lot of stuff in English and the child donation documents, at least some of them, mm -hmm. have been translated. Um, and I can I can fish out whose edition where that is um, and send that information to you. I'd appreciate that very much. Thank you. You're welcome. And now, now we have a very final question from Andy. Hi. Yeah, thanks very much, Poe. It's fascinating, fascinating stuff. Um, I wanted to. Uh, I was curious about something, a, a pagan practice that you haven't mentioned, which might not be connected to a cult of saints at all, which is astrology. Is that a mm. thing that is reflected on in, in in hagiographical sources, or is that completely absent, or is it even applicable in Egypt? I don't know. Maybe that starts in a later period. I don't know. Um, well, astrology exists. Uh in Egypt, um, uh, pre-Christianization, I know that because Andreas Winkler publishes on it, um, and he's a demetist. Um, so yeah, astrology is it's about, um, and I say he, he has published various demotic um, ostraca and such, uh, giving sort of your astrological uh, predictions such as you know after someone's been been born as far as whether it's still going on I mean I'd find it weird if it just sort of died entirely um just sort of for practical 
reasons, but it doesn't get mentioned in any of the hagiography I have looked at. So I don't know if that's because they consider it horrible and pagan or if it just wasn't something they were bothered about. Um, and I can't think of any astrological hacks, but that doesn't mean there isn't such a thing. That just means I don't know about it. Um, but yeah, as I say, doesn't, yeah, it doesn't get mentioned and I can't think of anywhere that it's attested kind of in the same way that some stuff like oracles uh, in my presentation doesn't get mentioned in hagiography but it's very blatantly attested so it was happening um so I can't answer that any further but I will add it to my list of things to look at <laughs> all right thanks <laughs> Yeah, thank you very much. And I, unless I missed uh, some questions, please join me in thanking once again, Chloe, for this fascinating presentation. And uh, thank you all of you for joining and see you next time. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye.